Okay, we're live. Okay, welcome, welcome everyone, and uh, welcome Jonas. So today is Thursday, the twenty first of January, and tonight we have a very, very, very VIP special guest uh, here with us, uh, Jonas uh, uh, Darlingin uh, from Switzerland. Um, I will introduce Jonas a little bit later. So uh, tonight is the second episode of Future Proof of this year of twenty twenty one. Uh, so those tuning in for the first time, uh, happy new year. Okay, so uh, COVID cases, uh, new COVID cases today, uh, 3,170 new cases. Uh, so not very good numbers. Uh, hopefully they continue to go down. Stay safe, uh, social distance, and uh, take care. Uh, doing a mic test, uh, for those of you who are tuning in, uh, just put into the comment section below if you can hear us fine. Sound check, testing. Uh, Jonas, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Fine. Okay, I can hear you good. I can hear you well as well. Okay, uh, so those of you joining us, hey, welcome. Now, please uh, feel free to share. Click on, you know, uh, share this session that's happening. Uh, like, right, like this, and, and also subscribe, right? So if you're on YouTube, click on the bell icon. Uh, choose all, right, so that you'll be notified each time we come on. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please follow us. If you're on Twitch, follow us. You know, tag your friends, tag your family. I know uh, I'm getting a lot of messages and a lot of a, a lot of uh, people are calling me up uh, asking me whether they should buy Bitcoin. So, um, you know, we've got someone who's very, very close to Bitcoin uh, uh, here with us tonight. Uh, so you're in for a treat. Uh, feel free to throw in any questions uh, when you you know when, when whenever like whenever just 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 put a put it in the comment section below put your questions in uh we'll we'll answer it right uh so tonight as i said we have someone who's very special uh his name is jonas schnelli uh from switzerland uh, he uh jonas is a you know bitcoin he is a bitcoin developer and maintainer now what does that mean i'll let jonas explain that to you right uh so without further ado um Jonas, welcome to Future Proof. Uh, over to you to introduce yourself. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, um, as I um, as Andrew said, my name is Jonas Schnelli. I uh, discovered Bitcoin um, in 2011 and started to uh, follow the code base back then and started to actively contribute uh, as a developer in 2013. Um, went then full time as a full time contributor in in 2015, and since then um, it's basically my job to work on on the code base of uh, Bitcoin Core, and um, also to maintain the code. Which means I'm one of uh, six people who has the rights to change the code, actually to merge uh, things. And um, yeah. And today I'd like you to uh, I'd like to share some information about how we work, um, how Bitcoin um, got Jonas? into the space. Yes. So if I can just uh, interrupt for 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 a minute there. Uh, so for for you know for for those who are tuning in, uh, Jonas uh, is only is one out of only six people in the world who actually has has the um, uh, the the access to check the Bitcoin Core code. Back into the into the repository on uh, on GitHub, so um, that you know, so he he works very closely with big like with Bitcoin. Uh, that that's how that's how important of a guest you are. <laughs> All right, back to you, Jonas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it, it is. There is some risks involved in being a maintainer. There's some uh, you need to have. Uh, yeah, I need to be careful about a lot of things. On the other hand, it's also a lot of, you know, uh, sometimes I call it a bit of the janitor's work. Uh, well, it's probably an understatement, but I think there's a lot of work that has to be done next to writing nice features and uh, adding stuff and changing icons. There's also people working in the background, giving feedback, uh, making releases, testing stuff. And as a maintainer, there's a lot of things you have to do uh, around that whole thing of getting a, a version out. And uh, yeah, let's start. Okay, so Jonas, you're gonna do a bit of a presentation for us. Yeah, I can. And whenever you have sent me questions, also Andrew, do, feel free to interrupt me and come up with a question. I think that's that's how you have a bit of an interaction. Sure. It's great for all. Okay. 
So, yeah, I think some of you have heard of uh, of Bitcoin for sure. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe some of you have heard of Bitcoin Core, which initially was actually the same thing. So when Satoshi wrote the white paper and the first initial software, it was just called Bitcoin. And at some point in time, I remember, I think it was 2015 when um, we remained the project, the uh, implementation, the software, we remained, renamed it from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Core to allow other software projects to also implement all those rules. Uh, in the retro perspective, this wasn't maybe the best uh, strategy to rename uh, the software away from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Core. But however, it's still the continuation of the code base from Satoshi. So it's the same developers working on that project. Um, yeah, the white paper you uh, maybe remember in having uh, saw that or even read that, that's Satoshi's clever idea how to uh, form a cryptocurrency. And out of that, the whole implementation has started and um, it's still the software project is still following uh, uh, those ideas and extending it. Um, when you go back in time, so two, 2009 was actually the time when um, the source code was released. And from the same source code, we're currently, uh, or that's still the same base we're working, working on daily. So we currently use GitHub as the main platform to work on, but the code which lies in GitHub is still um, coming, coming from Satoshi. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? No, that's not him, that's Dorian. <laughs> it's also not him, that's Greg Wag, a, a scammer. So Satoshi Nakamoto for all of you is still an unknown um, person or group of people um has been um has been left the project around uh, 2013 so he's no longer actively uh, contributing he's no longer um communicating with anyone so um is that good or bad sometimes people ask me well satoshi is gone that that's that's bad but i think for development it's actually a very good thing because there's no leadership and leadership tends to um be against decentralized decision making. As soon as there is a leader, people people tend to follow his decision or uh, her decision, uh, regardless of the scientific discussion around it. So I think it's a very good thing that there is no leadership in Bitcoin. Um, it gives a, a blank table for for great discussions and for finding the best way for uh, for future improvements. Uh, this is not the newest slide, but I think today we have around 20,000 commits. We have more than 500 contributors on the project, which means there has been more than 500 people actually changing the code or comments or documentation. Sounds off there are a lot of people, but actually at the end, it's roughly 10 people right now who are, um, who have contributed more than 80%. So it lies on, on really a handful of people to bring the project uh, further, to maintain it, to uh, stabilize it. And this is still only, or in my opinion, it's still very little and I'd like to see more. And I think we have saw last year that there's a, a lot of uh, companies coming into this space, either with funds or with active uh, developer uh, resources, which is a, a great outcome for everyone. Yeah, how, how did the source code administration history work? So um, it's more or less the GitHub um, administration history, which um, started with Satoshi Nakamoto as the main code owner. He gave rights to, um, to Gavin Andreessen um, to maintain the code. And he maintained it for a few years, then found Vladimir Vandalon, uh, uh, the, the still current lead maintainer of the project. Um, and because maintaining was getting more and more difficult, um, because the load of, of, of the, uh, the changes, the amount of changes uh, a maintainer had to review was getting uh, bigger and bigger. So he then found 
Peter, myself, and Marco Falke as uh, as co-maintainers. And we added also Michael Ford and Samuel Dobson um, during the last two or three years. Gregory Maxwell, a very prominent um, Bitcoin developer and Bitcoin thinker, had also maintained the rights during a time, but he, re he, he revoked uh, his rights himself to not get into uh, more fights with uh, how should Bitcoin look like. So this is the current uh, history, how, how administrative rights were, were giving out. Hey, Jonas. Uh, yes. So when I met you back in 2018, I think uh, what I remember was there were only one, uh, sorry, there were only four Bitcoin maintainers. Yes, right. So the two you see on the bottom, they were added mm -hmm. recently. Um, okay. Because the longer we go, the more um, yeah. bandwidth we have on the project, the more code we have to review. So yep. we are actually looking for, for even more uh, maintainers, but it's really hard to find the right people because it's not only about your developer skill set, your, uh, your education and background, it's also about stability uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a way, how much time you can offer to the project, how, how long you have been here and how trustworthy you are. So it's, uh, it's hard to find good maintainers, uh, but I think right now it's good, but very likely we'll need more in the future. Cool, cool. Um, so what is Bitcoin? Uh, sometimes the question pops up, yeah, what is Bitcoin? Of course, we can answer it's that coin that uh, rises in price over time, but not only. So it's uh, technically, it's, it's a set of rules, um, the consensus rules, the consensus layer. So the 21 million cap, uh, how, we, how, how the inflation happens in Bitcoin, how um, how transactions are uh, or, or have to be formed to get into a block. So all these technical rules, you could say these rules could also be written on paper, although that it's it's a very uh, detailed set of rules. So it's very hard to write it uh, just in a specification form on paper. Um, but that's the consensus layer. It's a very important part what Bitcoin makes Bitcoin and very important to know there is no central authority there is no central server there's no cop no copyright no ownership no no company behind bitcoin sometimes uh when people ask me yeah, what do you do and i tell them yeah i work on bitcoin oh you work for the company bitcoin yes no no it's not a company it's actually an, an, an open source project it's, it's as if you would say i work for the internet uh, that's also not a company. There's no central authority behind it. Uh, well, there's certain uh, certain organizations that help bring the internet for forward, but at the end, it's decentralized, and that's the same thing with Bitcoin. And this is really important uh, to distinct, or this is also an important distinction distinction between other cryptocurrencies that have central servers, central authority, central planning. And that's also a reason why there is no uh, roadmap. It comes up, the question comes up uh, every year. What is what is the roadmap of Bitcoin Core? What will you do next? That means if you would like to have a roadmap, if you would like to have a clear path where you like to walk through, that would require central uh, planning. Someone needs to decide what to do next, or at least a group, within a group, you need a leader. So it's very difficult to do central planning and roadmaps uh, in a decentralized system. That's why every contributor, every maintainer has its own view what should be done next. And things grow organically with how much resources you put in into uh, what direction. And that's also similar how Linux develops uh, um, its, its system. It's also by companies putting resources into the kernel uh, de development and wherever things happen, uh, it gets merged and moves towards that direction. And what is Bitcoin Core? So we had the um, slide, what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin Core? Bitcoin Core is basically in the software that implements those uh, rules um, around what is Bitcoin. And it's also more, it's also containing the peer-to-peer -peer network daemon, um, the system that can connect over the internet to other peers. It's not, if you, if you want to make an example, it's not 100% mandatory. You could also say, 
there could be other ways how transactions and and blocks get distributed over uh, over a network or over some layers to each other but i think right now the internet layer is the basically what we require to uh, share these transactions and blocks and there's also a wallet in bitcoin core which is absolutely not necessary for bitcoin as a network to run but for an individual running Bitcoin Core, uh, a wallet is quite handy, so you can store your coins there. It's more of an expertish wallet. Uh, it takes a lot of time to sync the blockchain the first time. So using that wallet gives you a lot of trust in what you see, but it, it's also, because it's a full node, it takes a lot of time to, uh, to run it or a lot of time to initially bootstrap it. And there's a lot of APIs in Bitcoin Core, which is required for companies to build stuff on top of it. There's the RPC API, CRMQ. We have a lot of uh, in and out channels uh, where additional software can be built on top of that. As I said, Bitcoin Core is the continuation of the Bitcoin project started by Satoshi Nakamoto. So the name change is not really uh, Th something leading to a, a new coin or something other than Bitcoin. So it's very important to know that Bitcoin Core is Bitcoin. And there is other there are other implementations of the Bitcoin uh, rule set, um, but none of those alternative projects have reached um, a high percentage of users. Um, a because it's 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 about financial um, structures. It's very crucial to have a uh, to trust in, in those applications you build up on top of uh, for financial um, activity. So getting a new software into hand into the hands of users actively running it means they need to trust that new project. And that's usually quite hard, especially uh, if the, tr the track, track record of the former project has been more or less good. So I guess that's one of the reasons why um, Bitcoin Core has, uh, has that high dominance on the full node market, um, because it's very hard to, to, to come up with an alternative implementation and find users that trust it. On the other hand, it's, in, it's impossible to say how much nodes uh, are on the network or give an accurate number um, because there, there, there's a lot of full nodes not listening uh, from the outside to people wanted to go to connect to it. So we don't actually know how much full nodes are on the network, but we can do estimations and we can count those uh, who are available on the network and then add a factor for those who aren't. So to come up with an estimation. However, if someone tells you there's exactly 10,000 nodes on the network, you know now it's absolutely not for sure to tell that to someone. So who is behind Bitcoin Core? Um, as I said, there's uh, open source uh, contributors all over the world. I'd say it's probably 10 to 15 right now that are very active. Uh, funding got much better than when I met Andrew back in 2018. So right now there's a lot of companies uh, willing to fund developers. There's money uh, available, but actually right now the lack is more in finding uh, skilled developers to, to have the will to work on Bitcoin Core. And, um, but there's also some part-time contributors doing it every month or every here and there. Uh, um, these are m more in the uh, range of, uh, in, in the area of 50 people. And very important to know, as I said, there's no legal organization. There is no um, organization behind those uh, contributors. Well, there, there are maybe for some uh, kind of a open source vessel, how they get funded, but there's no organization behind the whole development. Uh, who can change the code? Because, you know, if you look at the code, there's a lot of fundamentals like the 21 million cap, um, things like that, those rules. So changing the, changing the code basically means uh, changing the currency and risking the whole market cap that Bitcoin currently has. Um, so who can change the code? That's always an important question. Um, 
it's open source, as I said, and we communicate on GitHub, which is an open platform. So when every when 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 someone proposes a change, it's public. So it cannot be shut down because the one that opens the the, the change has a negative um, emotional feeling around it. You know, could be some big enemy of Bitcoin or some altcoin uh, leader. So, but however, because it's open things need to be scientific so it's public and it's open so whenever someone proposes a change it gets a reasonable discussion and it's it's absolutely doesn't matter who has opened the change what matters is what is the change how it is technically done is it something that helps bitcoin or not and everyone is also free to to uh, to comment on those proposed changes so there will be a discussion and everyone is invited in this in this discussion and it's scientific, so there's no, I don't like that because it's it's not in my favor. <clears throat> it needs to be scientific. And um, I think that's that's the openness of that project is very important as every open source project should be. And having a scientific level discussion is what brings us really to a state of <clears throat> high quality software. And at the end, if the change is reasonable and there's no, serious objections it will lead to merge after a lengthy discussion after lengthy tests and that's actually the place where a lot of um, newcomers or new contributors stop because it's super fundamentally different to corporate software development corporate software development usually means well maybe someone looks at the code you wrote a little bit maybe not you merged it yourself there's a fast development happen uh, in corporate software development usually and having um with bitcoin core the main key we're 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 trying to respect is stability don't break anything that's 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 the main rule so things go really slow things get really the criticism is at the high level so if you write the write a change a lot of lines that you have wrote, written will be there will be other ideas how to write it better so you need to have a thick skin you need to be ready to um, accept better ideas and also ready to have a long lengthy uh, uh, timeline for getting your stuff merged so even s simple changes can have months until they get merged and that can be cumbersome if you're if you're here and want to change things and have 100% time and funding. So you need to have a lot of uh, actual workplaces uh, simultaneously to fulfill your your time. So Jonas, yeah, so it's it's a very scientific and democratic process then, right? Um, when it comes to uh, uh, deciding on the actually uh, deciding on change um that's right although i wouldn't call it democratic because democratic means 51 percent control uh, away 49 percent right so yeah. what we try is i mean there, there there are areas like how things look in the user interface where democratic process can be done and we can even overthrow um um um, people not liking it because it's a matter of taste there's uh it's not much not much risks involved but actual um rule changes consensus layer changes like taproot is one that's currently um uh, in the pipeline these things are or we we try to get everyone on the same page uh, re regarding the change set or the con the conceptual change um, because a democratic process, uh, as we have seen in, in some countries, some popular countries, uh, is not always uh, the greatest thing, especially if you're close to the 50% uh, area. So we try to get everyone on uh, agree on the change. And if there is um, even uh, even um, critics from, from minorities, we try to, to listen to it and find a way that, that helps everyone which uh, is, in my opinion, forming consensus in general. Forming consensus means everyone should agree at the end. Of course, it cannot always be done. There will always be voices against certain changes. 
but it shouldn't be around 30 or 40 percent in time in in terms of a voting process that that's not how things get uh, get better okay so that's why that's why it takes so long to uh to 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 get it through um yeah one thing is you know you probably try or you 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 focus on soft forks on changing these consensus uh, rules like we had with segregated witness in 2017 um it takes a takes not only a long time because of technical reasons of course we'd like to test everything in depth and take time to do that that can be for uh, larger changes one two three years um but also to get the community agree on something I remember when the scaling debate or the you know how big should oh, the block yeah. size be and everything yeah. that started in my opinion very early with discussions uh, and you know forums uh, and, and uh, you know meetings we had uh, public meetings and invited everyone so it took years until um, the consensus was formed and even even in the end there were uh yeah we had that hard fork so not and not everyone agreed on it but i think it made it clear that it's much better if everyone agrees on, on the same rules and if there is like a very small percentage um of course it's still possible that they fork into their own rules um but it should be around 95 percent that's that's for sure okay thanks thanks for that yeah um I, there's a question here i've just flashed on the screen Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, can Bitcoin move to proof of stake? Um, well, I'm not an expert in proof of stake. I'd say uh, absolutely unlikely because it's one of the, uh, I think proof of work is one of the key points uh, how Bitcoin works. Um, I'd say every, I mean, Bitcoin was built to resist change. That's one thing you need to respect because the digital, in the digital world, everything is copyable, everything is changeable. There's no unique thing because it's digi digitally. So um, Bitcoin was built to actually resist that, to have unique digital elements to prevent from double spending and therefore it's somehow built to resist changes as also on the consensus layer it's not built that everyone can change the 21 million cap the proof of work or towards proof of stake so it's very hard to make bigger steps away from what it is now and proof of stake would be a big change from the current um, economical model bitcoin uses to a different one and i think it's extremely unlikely to happen because bitcoin is that trust uh, or has that trust on it should change uh, or it sh shouldn't change and it should stay as 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 it is now to keep the value we have so yeah. answering the question very unlikely but who knows uh, uh, but i think extremely unlikely okay thank you um maybe let's go down the route uh, who what proposals are getting merged so as i said there will be um, kind of a process of review and at the end if the if the uh, proposal is reasonable and had a uh, kind of a lengthy discussion um if it's good or bad it will lead to a merge and merge means it gets into the main code base there's one main code base and from that main code, code base, we actually do half year uh, releases. So version 0 0.21, that's coming out uh, in the next days, probably. That's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's when we actually freeze, freeze the code base and make a release out of it. Who can merge? As I said, it's those six maintainers. They have the right to merge uh, proposals into the main branch. And of course, um, it's not all, all only lying on their shoulders, the, the risks of merging something. It's also about who did uh, review the change. And at the end, I think risks are pretty much balanced between the owner of the change, the reviewers and the maintainers. And box happened for sure, but merging it into into the main uh, repository 
or main branch doesn't mean it's automatically uh, automatically within the user's uh, space. At the end, users need to upgrade and they can say yes or no. And when it's in the master branch, there's also time for testing. So um, there's a lot of uh, elements how to improve the code and how to fix bugs. As I said, ultimately users decide what Bitcoin is. Um, if if Bitcoin Core implements a change that's not reflecting the user users' wishes, user users can decide to not run the new software, uh, and users can can decide to uh, use another uh, full node implementation or even create another full node implement implementation and change certain things. So at the end, it's the users uh, who decide what the current state of Bitcoin is. And with users, I mean, you know, individuals, miners, companies running a full node. That's also why running a full node um, is quite important because by running a full node, you enforce those rules. And if no one is running a full node, who, who, who decides what the rules are? So I think that's also an important part of running a full node. It's enforcing those rules and checking that no one is cheating in that game. And everyone can continue its own code fork of Bitcoin Core. It's absolutely possible. Forking the code is not forking the chain. That's two different things. Uh, forking the code means you copy the code and you do your own changes and maybe call it some something else. Uh, that's possible and that's not even evil. That's uh, sometimes a good idea. Um, although changing the consensus layer, the rule set that's a harder process um everything that changes those rule sets or even uh lightlier things we have that bip process um that's that's like a standard body process so we have documents we call them bitcoin approval um papers or it's the process is called bitcoin improvement process um that's how specifications can be written and posted and um, stored in a, in a in a single repository so everyone knows all the players knows know what change is eventually happening and at the end there's soft forks and hard forks soft forks usually are uh, graceful up or we call you can call them graceful upgrades that's when um we wait for a certain threshold to reach, uh, the signaling threshold to reach. Uh, historically, that has been done with miners. So if uh, a high percentage of miners agree to a change or signal that they are ready for the change, the change actually locks into uh, the software and is then effective. Hard forks are changes that has to be done simultaneously all over the network at a single point in time and are therefore uh, very uh, very crucial or very dangerous for the uh, network security and may need to be done at some point, but should be avoided um, if, if possible and softworks should be used instead to have a much, uh, much better security in upgrading the system. Um, yeah, and then there are some, some companies that put resources in Bitcoin Core. Um, some prominent ones uh, you see on the screen. Chaincode is probably the, the biggest right now. Chaincode working from New York. Uh, Blockstream, OKCoin, OK the exchange, uh, Coinbase, and the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Those are probably the, the main ones that put resources in right now. Jonas, uh, yeah. that that list has changed, hasn't it? Because I remember um, when uh, uh, when I saw that list uh, back in 2018, I think uh, Bitmain was on there, and uh... yes, that's right. So Bitmain uh, sponsored two developers, myself and another one um, from Portugal, um, until end of last year. But they they stopped that I think because of restructural reasons. But they they sponsored for at least four years uh, in, in uh, two developers. So, okay. And I think there's more smaller companies. It's not a complete list, um, but I think that's probably the main ones right now. 
Sure, sure. Thank you. There's alternatives to Bitcoin Core, um, namely Lib Bitcoin, BTCD, Bitcoin Unlimited, probably no longer. Uh, I wouldn't use that for sure. But BTCD is um, probably um, the best alternative implementation. Um, yeah, and hopefully there are more to come. And ideally, there will be a, a shared project that could be modularized um, that handles the whole consensus part of it because the consensus should stay the same over all implementations and that's very risky if everyone implements the consensus themselves risks of forks um, and ideally there's one module that does the consensus and all these projects work on that module yeah q and a if you have all some. right oh uh, there's plenty of q and a i think uh so i'll go in order and i'll flash them on the screen so mm -hmm. Alexander um, has a question. Uh, why did Bitmain cut off their funding to BTC core development? Uh, I honestly don't know um, why they did that. Um, I just read in the news, uh, public information that they think had to split the company into um, the mining business and other business, something like that. And I guess it was just a restructural reason. It could be possible that they take up funding again at the later stage. Um, I think it wasn't uh, wasn't due to a political uh, strategy or because they don't like Bitcoin Core or something like that. I think it's just just not their focus right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have another question from. Uh... Mr. Tu, uh, will quantum computing threaten the network? Um, quantum computing, yeah, if you don't know what it is, it's actually a new field in physics, how things can be computed. Rather than having one and zero, you have multiple states, or at least three states. And um, it, in on paper, it allows to break some assumptions we have in cryptography. Uh, one that's uh, really important for Bitcoin is the discrete logarithm. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a mathematical assumption that, that actually protects your private keys or protects your coins from not being uh, spent without the key. And with on paper, with certain powerful quantum computers, it's um, theoretically possible to break the discrete logarithm to actually spend bitcoins with just having the public key. And, but we are very likely years, uh, years away from actually um, doing that in not on just paper. So I think it is a threat, um, although the threat is quite theoretically and uh, very likely quite far away, eventually never being possible to execute. But of course, um, as soon as it gets more realistic, um, things will happen. But that's not within the next five years. That's more likely within the next 20 years. But it's it's absolutely possible to switch to a, a, a quantum computer resilient cryptography at some point in time. Cool. And, and when that happens, um, I suppose the maintainers will then merge that code into the, the code base. Yeah, for, I mean, first, uh, the whole cryptographer space needs to work out these uh, crypt, uh, quantum crypt, uh, cryptography technologies. I think there's Lampert signatures and stuff like that that are uh, provable quantum uh, computer safe. I think it's, it's still a scientific uh, researcher thing uh, rather than something that can be implemented, implemented right now. Yep, yep. Um, I have a question here from Alex. Uh, do sponsors try to influence or control the way Bitcoin operates? Yeah, that's a good question. So my experience, uh, my my experiences or the sponsors I had, they never tried to uh, uh, influence my work. I think what most sponsors see is that they making some profit on top of Bitcoin. Taking a, a, an exchange as an example, they 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 had they collecting a lot of fees because people trade Bitcoin and people uh, want to buy Bitcoin because the price is stable or even goes up, 
so they have a high interest that the network runs because if the network doesn't run means they don't have the ability to collect fees um, and therefore the clever ones they see that they have to fund the base layer um, because otherwise they cannot make profit and I think that's also why they don't want to uh, involve or influence uh, uh, the, the whole process because they just want that it goes on as it did in the past years and influencing would not be something that would be seen as evil in my opinion because you look look at linux how linux is built there's red hat there's debian there's uh, ibm and they have their interests uh in in linux and they put resources at linux to uh form it in their direction and i think that's absolutely fine as long as there's a great balance of uh of economical players yeah yeah it's um it it's very interesting, isn't it? Because if, if you think of um, Bitcoin, it's almost it's almost a like a public good, like it's 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 there for everyone, um, but but no one owns it. But yet, it is everybody's responsibility uh, to maintain it to ensure that uh, that you know the continuity of 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 the Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that that nails it pretty pretty good because also. Some companies have not, or bigger companies, I uh, just take now Coinbase as an example, they haven't contributed to Bitcoin Core over years, um, but still making a lot of money on, on top of it. And I think somehow that, that I'm not sure if that is a clever strategy because you, you want to have a stake in the base layer uh, if you have a company that makes uh, or uses that base layer as, as the main infrastructure. So working on that is not also not only giving back to the community; it's also you having having a shoe uh, in the door in terms of things uh, uh, changed not in the direction you want. Yeah, yeah, um, and 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 also even for the you know the community of Bitcoin holders or hodlers out there, right? Um, uh, you know, like uh, it is. Uh, I, I feel it's my responsibility to uh, give something back to the network because, um, or to the Bitcoin network because it is, it's given so much to me, you know. So it, it's it's uh, it's like the Earth. You got to look after the Earth because you know we've only got one Earth, and uh, if we destroy it, it's gone and and, and, and it'll be gone for generations. Yeah, I, I really think that mentality should be should be uh, yeah that that should be adapted a lot because that's also how I went into. Uh, uh, Bitcoin development in 2013, the price went over. I think it was a hundred dollar uh, a coin, and I thought, "Well, wait, now it's going really uh, over the roof." <laughs> back then, <laughs> and um, I thought, "Well, it's time to also start to give something back to to work on 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 that protocol uh, to help people." And I think holders, of course, they they uh, they are part of Bitcoin. They they unwillingly part of uh, the development process and of course we should all work together uh, to bring it forward yeah so it's it's quite different from you know uh, uh, a for-profit organization when you kind of look at it from from that perspective i guess um so we have another question uh so we've answered the one about the influence okay so elvin he's my brother um and he's got a question <laughs> So since Bitcoin is not a legal entity, do you think that um, the SEC might try to go after the, the code developers instead? Who knows? I don't hope so. Um, I don't think there is legal um, ground for, for doing so. Um, but you never know what happens. And I, I, I think this, the SEC has probably not the interest to shut down Bitcoin because when they shut down Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies will come up with more um, anti-SAC features, I call them. You know, Bitcoin is pretty much non-private in terms of uh, the blockchain is super public. Everyone can follow transactions. And I still think it's the lesser evil for these organizations like the SEC to have Bitcoin and have it, having it somewhat controllable. Although the question then comes up, what if Bitcoin implements uh, higher privacy features, uh, stuff that makes uh, coins non-fungible, so non-followable? 
And um, yeah, we'll see. I think regulatory will come up during the next five or 10 years. And uh, there's some some challenges for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, the questions are rolling in. I've got uh, Ken who's asking whether Bitcoin will have the same problems with, uh, or oh, like Ripple. Um, I, I I don't think, think so, but I'll, I'll, I'll let yeah. you answer that. <laughs> As I said, I'm not an expert in all coins. I don't know Ripple uh, too too deep, but uh, as it looked to me, Ripple had this pre-mining uh, or this large pre-mining, and it's not it's not having these properties of a decentralized uh, cryptocurrency. It's for me, to be honest, it looks pretty scamish, uh, and I think the SEC they they probably also got on that uh, side of the debate that Ripple is not really cryptocurrency and people are getting scammed. That's why they pulled the trigger there. And it's eventually possible that they extend that to other cryptocurrencies. Um, but I think it's very unlikely that they that a similar thing could happen to Bitcoin because of the properties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, going back to the previ uh, previous question from, from Alvin where, um, you know, uh, because Bitcoin is not a legal entity, will will they come after the the, the developers? I, I, I think my my take on it is um, is well. Then I mean, it's at at its core, it's it's just open source software. Mm -hmm. So essentially, um, then you'd be going after Linux. You'd be going after you know um, all the other developers of the of open source software. Yeah, I think it's it's they figured out it's impossible. I just remember when they banned cryptography, and I remember um, Adam Beck having printed that T-shirt with the source code of an RSA encryption, which was kind of uh, banned to export from the US, and it was just the whole source code was on a T-shirt, so it was pretty much obvious for everyone. You cannot ban information that's you, you can write down on a piece of paper. And um, I think the same uh, logic you can apply to Bitcoin. If you if you hunt developers down, go after them. It's you know new developers will come up. It's it's yeah. just a matter of time, and and they organize better, uh, and you get a, a weaker position in having a stake in it. So I think it would make no sense for an organization to to do that, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so Jonas, let's let's move on to. Uh, so I, I've got a few questions myself, right? So um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before you, you know, how did you discover BTC, uh, you know, Bitcoin, and how did you, you know, uh, as you said in 2013, dedicate your life to, uh, you know, to to Bitcoin. Well, okay, let's let's start that. <laughs> well, I, um, I I'm a software engineer my whole life, so I, I wrote my first online shop uh, in the '90s when the internet was not even a thing. I uh, started to work on uh, mobile iOS software development extremely early, and at some point in time, I was a bit bored of corporate uh, of the corporate software development world. Uh, it was kind of, you know, nonsensical to me. Um, and then a, um, an employee of me came came up, uh, that was in 2011, and told me about, have you heard about Bitcoin? Uh, I, I think he picked it up at some meeting, Web Tuesday or something like that. And um, I thought, well, that's probably the next bullshit of, uh, of ideas. And started to to read more about more about it because it kind of stuck in my head. A financial network just purely on top of the internet uh, kind of you know made me made me curious and and it made total sense to me. And um, I started to play with it. And in 2013, I thought, well, uh, I think I need to need to, uh, it just looks so phenomenal and it works and it has now a track record of fund of of, uh, of, of crazy four years uh, and um, <laughs> it must run, it must be stable and I started to dedicate my time towards it. Wow and, and, and you've never you haven't looked back since. No, no, no I think. It, it still attracts me every day and um, it's great to work. It's always, it's, there's always new, th new stuff happening. It's a lot of interaction with people. Uh, it's, it's, it's also not location based. I don't need to go into an office. Um, 
which which suits my 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 needs how i i like to work and i i there's no no end near for me yeah. at least yeah all right so we have a question from babar um what do you like most about bitcoin over everything else in the industry yeah i guess with everything else you or he means uh all coins or different cryptocurrencies and um you know bitcoin is for, for me i i I, I, I started with Bitcoin. I, I remember following or reading a white paper about Ethereum, but I was never interested in other ideas. A, because of my time. B, I, I, I didn't, or even back then, I, I thought they have little chance to uh, repeat the momentum Bitcoin had because of the, the single uh, possibility in time. And I think, for me, I'm I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I never had to deal or deal with other cryptocurrencies, and um, can't tell you that much about these other coins. <laughs> okay, cool. So I, I've I've got another question. Um, uh, oh, actually, uh, the the next question was actually what made you like what what single point um, in time that made you decide that you were going to dedicate yourself to to Bitcoin. Or did you kind of answer that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think there's probably many uh, elements uh, leading to that. One was that I uh, kind of was repeating um, a lot in my former position in doing corporate software. Um, and B, when the price, I remember exactly when the price was like hitting that $60, $70 a coin range. And I thought um, that was the first bull run i uh, i witnessed and it looked like to me there's actually people seriously believing in it not not only myself so there's actually a network effect happening and 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 another element was development was really uh, professionalized so the people that worked on bitcoin core were actually the, the guys i looked really up to and they they made good job and i i'd liked uh, i wanted to learn from them and uh uh, therefore, went down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's that's amazing, and uh, and you know, thank you for your work. Like, uh, so um, the other question that I I have is uh, so in in this ecosystem, right? Um, that is Bitcoin. How do developers actually get funding? Like, how do they? You know, let's say tomorrow, uh, I'm not a software engineer and so i i wouldn't be but let's say i decided hey you know i want to dedicate my life to to bitcoin uh tomorrow um how would they then go about making that sustainable and um you know get mm -hmm. funding yeah i think there is a lot of opportunities not only for developers um i i know the development route uh, route good but i think there's also uh, um open positions or open funding pots for people willing to help the the community is it like writing documentation moderating etc cetera, etc cetera. um for developers um i think the best thing is if if one already has uh, some track record open source track record uh, a github profile things he has done in the past best is also if someone starts in their spare time to work on on, on some changes on some simpler changes uh, on bitcoin core and then uh, at some point asking for funding uh, is much more possible but even if you have a, a corporate track record as a skilled developer i think you you'll you'll find someone uh, willing to sponsor you and if you're not a developer there's a lot of companies looking for uh, for people willing to work on their products or uh, also on open source things more more in, more in the direction of documentation um, i think you just need you need to you know go for it and i i think uh there is there is opportunity cool all right so uh alvin my brother has another question for you uh, have you sold any of your own personal bitcoin uh, and do you regret selling it uh what is your personal investment strategy for bitcoin going forward and why yeah <laughs> good question uh i think you know i'm not an investor i'm not a uh, i'm not a investment strategy guy i have no experience in it but of course um uh, you know when i first um first bought my first bitcoin for you know development and playing around with it 
uh, I, I, I lost, I sold at, at silly prices uh, from the retro perspective. Um, but I never regret it. Um, I'm also not kind of not too much interested in wealth and money. So for me, that's not, not a big, big topic. That's probably one of the, the, the main, um, qualities, uh, to be a maintainer, isn't it? Yeah. I think, you know, if you, if you need to look daily on the chart and, you know, there even, yeah, I think you need to have a passion for software development. If you don't have that passion, um, you cannot do it and if you have the passion for software development you're more likely the guy that sits on a pc and you know reads books and stuff like that so yeah i guess it's it's a different type of people and investors and you know but I'm not i'm not kind of you know saying that developers are the better people but i think it's just two two distinctions yeah yeah um did you ever imagine that uh, Bitcoin would hit forty-two thousand uh, dollars. Never ever, <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, I, you know, people came to me when the price was a hundred dollar. Well, I saw now it's a hundred dollar. Should I buy? And I told them, well, it's probably now the peak. You know, it, uh, it very likely won't go higher. And at some point, it was five hundred dollar and thousand. And the people asked me the same question, and I always said, oh, "It's very likely now the top. You know, it will go down. So be prepared." And at ten k, the same. Twenty k, the same. Of course, it went down and up again. And now it's forty, and the people ask me, "Well, is it the top?" And I'm still telling them the same. Yeah, it's probably very high, but um, right now I'm more convinced it, it goes further up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, the the, the network effect um, that has taken place. Mm. I mean, if you if you think about it, it's you know it's 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 only uh, well it, it's only twelve years old, but you know twelve years old uh, for the that that it has survived. Um, yeah, it, I think it's, it's the longer it runs, the more trust it it gets. Uh, the more yeah. uh, Bitcoin is dead, bubble bursts, the media rides, it survives. The stronger it gets out of it, I think it's. Um, but of course, you know, it's still a volatile uh, asset and people need to be prepared yeah. to lose a lot of money. And I think right now there's also a lot of retailing uh, coming into the space. And this will, uh, this is eventually the opposite of hodling because they have no idea what it is and uh, it will lead to <laughs> higher volatility in the short term, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's always um, higher volatility. Uh, you know, what's that saying? Uh, people come for the something and then they stay and and they become hodlers right and then they yeah they i i, I think yeah. so you know <laughs> going through the first beer market and coming out of it makes you stronger and not wanting to sell your coins again if you went to a beer and go to a ball market again and yeah. i guess the more people that that experience uh, that uh, the more likely it will be stable yeah. upwards yeah and, and you know so look um you know it, it's it's uh it's uh, you know it's it's uh when I when I first read about Bitcoin um this was the first time I read about it, it was probably 2013 um it's almost like everybody's experience is the same like when they when they first hear about Bitcoin you're like that's not gonna mm. work and then you start researching you start reading more you start hitting the forums and asking questions people respond to you and you read even more. You go down this rabbit hole uh, and you just cannot stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's is absolutely it, true. Is it, yeah. is it still the same for you? Yeah, well, I mean, the technology, I still have, there There are parts on the pro, in the protocol and in the software I haven't fully under, understand. I'm, I'm learning every day. And there's new changes like Taproot is a good example that has a lot of uh, new uh, properties and new structures in it that, that, that fascinates me. And the rabbit hole has not ended for me. And I think you, you, you described it really good to people. You, you cannot tell someone this is the thing. They have to discover it, it their self. You just can throw pieces uh, in their way and eventually they read it. But uh, yeah, I experienced the same. Everyone uh, first rejected uh, the idea. And then at some point they were trusted, started to read about it. And it made the click moment. And they started to either invest or work on it. Yeah, you just cannot unsee what you've seen. It's like you've been, you've just, uh, you've seen the light. 
<laughs> yeah. And of course, the political situation, the economical situation we're in right now, uh, eventually boosts the whole adaption uh, further unexpectedly. Yeah, 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 definitely. Hey, um, so what are your thoughts about layer two solutions like mm -hmm. the Lightning Network uh, on top of Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm still a believer in, in having that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cash system. Um, right now, because of the fees and the scaling um, and, you know, the store of value as the proposition, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to have it as a... a medium of exchange, but I, I think it's an important part in the future. So, and also to know that this has been built is important for the system as a store of, of value. Um, right now it's hard to transact because of the volatility, but I think in future stuff like lightning uh, um, will be ready to actually serve as a, as a medium, medium of exchange to bring it uh, to millions of people. I think it's fundamentally important and it's also reflecting reflected in the current exchange rate in my opinion and yeah. it's still very early these technologies like lightning um but there's a lot of development happening right now and i think at some point in time it will be super stable and ready actually exactly then when it's needed awesome all right so we have one more question um do you think the current proof of work model is sustainable, uh, say 50 years from now, if Bitcoin is at a million dollars? Yeah, I think the proof of work model, the, the bigger question is probably what what is if the block reward goes further down? Um, so mining is maybe no longer profitable. Uh, it's hard to tell um, what happens, but I think, um, you know, scaling will be done. So there will be uh, more transactions possible in less space. Take just Taproot as an example. It allows to do uh, some some more advanced um, transactions in, in, in less space. So that means we get more fees for the same space and this will eventually continue. So I guess the miners have a higher chance to collect more fees with the same uh, uh, thing they do right now. And of course, uh, eventually miners need to shut down some equipment to be profitable because the difficulty uh, uh, is, is in a state where it's no longer profitable. And I, I think it's not a problem if the difficulty goes down and there's less mining happening because right now the hash power we have behind Bitcoin is actually too much physically too much for what we uh, what we protect and or one could say it's too much and i think having less hash power is absolutely fine interesting um yeah so uh oh i had a I had a question uh, about um uh uh the uh yeah, so it, it's also interesting. You mentioned the the hash rate. So essentially, you know, to the viewers uh, who don't know, the hash rate is um, the mechanism to protect the Bitcoin network to make it uh, costly for someone to try to uh, attack the Bitcoin network. Um, and it's the brilliance of it is in such a way where, I guess, um, if you're gonna spend that much money to attack the network, you might as well comply with the rules. Uh, and earn some Bitcoin while you're at it. Absolutely, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. going back to the proof of stake question, proof of work is really amazes me every day how it's how it's done and how smoothly it works. I think it's one of the really really big key elements that Satoshi invented, and um, I, I don't think it, it will go away over time. It will be optimized. But it makes it so costly for an attacker. You know, if you want to double spend the rollback uh, six blocks, it's so costly that you rather invest. If you have, a, if you are economically driven, you rather invest that into mining equipment and make money out of it. And even if you're a state-sponsored actor that needs to uh, needs to, wants to kill Bitcoin, it's so costly and so ineffective at the end because people will reorganize around it. That it's probably probably impossible to uh, attack it, attack it from that there that side. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the the question I wanted to ask you. So um, as you know, so it's uh, 
based on Bitcoin's uh, release model. So right now, um, based on the last halving, uh, it's it releases uh, six and a quarter Bitcoin every block into uh, into existence. Right, it it um, mints that into existence. Uh, so that's around nine hundred Bitcoin a day. Mm -hmm. What what happens when it gets to the tail end of it? At, you know, say in one hundred twenty years, in twenty one forty. Um, I mean, it, it will never stop uh, re release. You'll never really reach a theoretical 21 million Bitcoin, right? It'll mm -hmm. be, yeah. Yeah, it's less. Yeah, I think, you know, that every every halving, every uh, 200,000 200, blocks, the reward is exactly uh, divided by two. So you get just a half of it at, at the point in time as a miner. Um, but I think you know um, there 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 are possibilities uh, how miners can still be profitable. Either it's the fees that are also collected in the block. Um, obviously, that would mean um, Bitcoin is either uh, worth much more than it is today, or less miners, or uh, energy is getting free and equipment is getting uh, getting free. Um, or there could be other techniques. I just, uh, or at some point, I read uh, an article about someone claiming or saying that miners with their equipment will eventually trying to uh, um, to to recover lost funds because there's a lot of lost funds uh, in the space. You know, we, probably a, a single digit uh, percentage of all bitcoins have, have ever have, have been lost just because of forgetting passphrases and stuff like that and it could be that's just theoretical thing at some point we we have to improve the cryptography because of quantum or whatever and some coins will still be protected by weak uh, cryptography and eventually miners or something similar to miners will try to unlock these now insecure coins with their equipment some stuff like that you know we what i'd like like to say with that we don't know what happens in future uh, there's different aspects to it and i think mining will always be profitable in my opinion Thank you. Thanks, Jonas. Hey, Jonas, so um, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's it's great to see you again. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, glad to hear that you're staying safe, right? Um, so is Switzerland on lockdown right now? or? Um... Yeah, a mild lockdown. So they pretend it's a lockdown, but it's actually not a real lockdown. So <laughs> schools are still open, shops, essential shops are open, which even that's means, uh, uh, yeah. But it's 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 not a problem here. Yeah, uh, that's good. That's good. And it's um it's pretty cold right now, isn't it? Yeah, snow outside. So nice. It's cold. <laughs> Opposite of your uh, your region, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in the thirties. <laughs> We're getting thirty yeah. plus degrees Celsius. I, I'd All love right. to. Yeah, we we can switch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so once once this whole virus thing is down, and if you're ever in the region, um, we would love to to you know, I'd love to catch up. Yeah, I'd love to travel again and for sure come back to your offer. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. All right, so Jonas, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing um, your 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 immense knowledge um, in this space. And uh, and thank you for contributing to Bitcoin. Uh, and and for all those viewers out there who are watching now, um, and if you hold Bitcoin. Right. Think about how we can give back to Bitcoin. Like, you know, it, it belongs to everybody. Nobody owns it, but we all benefit from it. it it's like the earth. So, um, you know, uh, and, and if any last words on, on how we can give back to, to Bitcoin. Yeah, I think best is, you know, look at GitHub. There's uh, some developers still need sponsors. So there's GitHub sponsorship. That's an opportunity to fund uh, developers. Also try to uh, use your skills to improve it, either it's documentation, translation, stuff like that. And yeah, just look for opportunities to give back. That's that's probably essential. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, fantastic. Thank you again, uh, Jonas. Uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> right. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, See have all. a great one. Thank you, Jonas, bye-bye. Thanks, Andrew. Bye.